Okay, well, uh, welcome everybody to, to this seminar. So this seminar is organized by uh, UNSW, but it's more globally organized as part of the Statistic Across Campuses Initiative. So today we're quite happy to have uh, Lynn from ANU, who's uh, going to give the talk. Uh, I met Lynn a, a bit over a year ago when I went to visit ANU to give a seminar and Lynn had just arrived from the US. So Lynn did his undergrad and PhD uh, in the US, and then he came to uh, ANU to do his postdoc with um, Alan Welsh and uh, Francis. Okay, so today, uh, Lynn is going to talk about estimation of continuous non-gaussian graphical models. So Lynn, the screen is yours. And okay. Francis. Yeah, so thank you, um, Boris, for letting me the opportunity to speak at the seminar. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining the seminar today. And uh, I hope that, I mean, yeah, you can hear me clearly. So this one is uh, one of my recent works with my advisors, so, uh, Francis Free and Professor Alan Wells at uh, ANU. And, uh, same with the other University of Sydney. So um, today, the topic of my talk is about the graphical model. So uh, the plan for the talk today is, um, first of all, I will uh, talk about the graphical model problem in general and make some kind of line, a brief literature review of what has been done and kind of line um, what is the active research area on that? And then the focus of the talk will be uh, a new method that we propose for the estimating the graphical model. And then uh, I will talk about one simulation study and a related example. And hopefully at the end, uh, I will have some discussion as well as a conclusion as well. So, um, Okay, so uh, let's begin with uh, the graphical model problem. So uh, I particularly interested in the talk is about the undirected graphical model. And essentially speaking, so in multivariate statistical analysis, an undirected graphical model is a representation of the conditional dependence relationship among random variables. So essentially, when we have the data, we have a lot of variables. So instead of talking about something like regression, like you try to predict one outcome from a lot of other predictors, we do a more or less like we only want to be interested in the pairwise relationship among all the random variables. And among all of the relationship that we can be interested in one of the most important relationship is the conditional independence or conditional dependence. So we're not just interested in whether two variables are marginally independent or dependent, but the relationship is conditional because we want to see even on the remaining variables in the data, whether any pair of random variables is still independent or dependent. So uh, in terms of like maybe the graph language a little bit. So if we have the random graph here with the P components, and so the undirected graph consists of the vertex set from one to P. So essentially each random variable correspond to one vertex. And then we have an edge set so it's like a set of pair, J and K. And here, because we have an undirected graph, so that means we don't distinguish J, K, and K, J. So that's why the graph is undirected. So if we distinguish the order, then we have a directed graphical model. But in the undirected graphical model, what we usually have from the graph here is, if we see a pair J and K not in the assets, that means that 
the two corresponding components, yj and yk, are conditionally independent given on the remaining variables. So if you see the S, like for example, JK in the S set, that means otherwise. So you are still conditional dependence given on the other variables already in the data. So uh, to kind of visualize the idea. So here is one example. This one, we have the data that represent on the physical chemical properties of Y in the data. So we have uh, 11 predictor or 11 um, variables here. So that kind of graph provides information on whether any two random variable is conditionally independent or conditionally dependent. So for example, if you see a line between like low rise and soon pass here, that means that they are conditionally dependent even on the other properties. But if you don't see the line connecting any vertex, like for example, there is no light between chloride and fixed acidity here, then that means that they are estimated to be conditionally independent. And so uh, that kind of graph provides like a very kind of concise way and visualization of the relationship among any pair of random variables in the data. Okay, so that is the idea for the undirected graphical model. But then now the main question is how can we estimate these models or these graphs from the data? And so we need to put some assumption on the data, on the distribution where the data come from. So here in the talk, I focus on the case when all the random variables are continuous. And so the most well-studied problem is the Gaussian graphical model. That means that we assume some multivariate data coming from a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And in that case, we have a really a nice property of the multivariate Gaussian, which is any com two components, let's say yj and yk, are conditionally independent if and only if the corresponding element in the inverse covariance of the precision matrix is equal to zero. And so that's why in that case, estimating the Gaussian graphical model is equivalent to estimating the precision matrix. And uh, uh, as you are unfamiliar with, the likelihood of the Gaussian distribution has a precision matrix on that. And so that's why a lot of like uh, efficient methods are already developed for the Gaussian graphical models because essentially, it is really related to the likelihood and you have uh, some kind of parameters to really estimate in. And so we can borrow a lot of methods developed in the literature, like estimation method for the precision matrix to estimating the graphical models for the Gaussian case. Well, however, I mean, the multivariate Gaussian distribution assumption is restricted and in my opinion, like Gaussian should be an exception, not the rule when you deal with the data. Like it's really rare when you have really the data following the Gaussian distribution. And like many, many physical process, they generate continuous but non-Gaussian data. And so non-Gaussian data should be the rule. The Gaussian is really an exception. Okay, now we move to the something called non-Gaussian graphical models. So when the data are non-Gaussian, then estimating the graphical is more challenging, especially now the relationship is a conditional dependent or conditional independent. So they are not marginal, but they are conditional. And so the two uh, existing 
kind of approach for estimating that kind of non gaussian graphical model in the literature the first approach is okay the data non gaussian but if we somehow can transform the data back to gaussian but still preserve conditional dependent structure then we are fine and that is uh, the approach that taken by some uh, kind of earlier works on that area like here the paper 2009-2012. So one typical example of that is the Gaussian copula model. But in general, that kind of um, approach is restrictive in the sense that it really depends on whether you can really make that kind of transformation or not. So that is the first approach. The second approach that also quite popular is, okay, so we talk about the conditional independent, conditional dependent, so likely is coming from the conditional distribution. But now, if we assume that the conditional distribution, one variable given all the others, for example here, if I take the conditional distribution of yj, given all the other variables, let's say I denote it as y and then minus j. If that conditional distribution have the same kind of support or depend on the same set of variable as the conditional mean, that means that now if I only need to take a look at the conditional mean, and if this conditional mean does not depend on yk, so that implies that yj and yk are conditionally independent. So that kind of assumption means that the conditional mean contains almost every information you need about the conditional independent or dependent structure. Well, when people take that kind of approach, the kind of um, limitation is you do not really know what kind of joint distribution the data coming from, except the Gaussian. Because in the Gaussian case, everything is really nice because you have the exact form for the conditional mean and conditional variance. And so we can kind of manage things quite well. But when the data non-Gaussian, it's not really easy to see which kind of joint distribution the data should come from so that this assumption can be satisfied. And so the area for the non gaussian graphical model is still very active. So we, in this world, what we approach the problem is different. So instead of trying to convert the data back to Gaussian or trying to assume the support for conditional mean and conditional distribution is the same. We think about, okay, let's model the continuous data directly by some flexible class of distribution. And the class of distribution that we chose is called the general line multivariate skew normal distribution. Okay, so a lot of like kind of complicated terms like general line and then skill normal. But the idea of that class of distribution is you start by the PDF of the Gaussian. And then after that, you introduce some kind of skewing function to make the data skew. So here, that's exactly two parts in the Joy density of this one. So the first part is the PDF of multivariate Gaussian. So let's say here C is a mean vector and sigma is a variance, covariance matrix of the normal distribution. Now here is the skewing part. So in a skewing part here, we have one skewing function. So the skewing function has to satisfy some condition, but in general, you see, like it is a distribution function of 
Junior variable, random variable that is dimension around zero. So the condition, it had to satisfy this one. And it has to be bound between zero and one. So it's kind of like the CDA, uh, a symmetric random variable in the zero. Okay, the next here is the shape vector is the alpha. And the alpha controls kind of how far we are deviating from the Gaussian. So if alpha, the vector here is zero, and then the G function is one half everywhere. Then we are back to the multivariate skew normal, uh, sorry, multivariate Gaussian. But by kind of varying the alpha, we can deviate away from the Gaussian. And uh, the other part here, the omega matrix is kind of like the diagonal matrix uh, with the like, and all of the diagonal elements are just the variance, you know, the standard error term for the uh, sigma here because it is just a diagonal of that. And the C, again, is the mean of the normal random variable that we um, introduce in the base function. And um, the end, that's the form of the uh, density for the general line multivariate skew normal distribution. Okay, so we have uh, two more things in the density. One is the skewing function, and the other is the shape vector. And by introducing the two additional parameters like that, one is the function, the other is the shape vector, we can capture more shape of the data. So here on the left, I have the bivariate data from the Gaussian distribution. So, yeah, so the skewness is zero. And also, almost we don't have any tail for the, the tail is very kind of light for the Gaussian. Then in the right part here, so each row corresponds to one set of alpha, the shape vector. And each column corresponds to one skewing function. And so if we vary them, we can get more share of the data. So like in this one here, so the plot is kind of by left skew, but when I change that, I can make it right skew. And even if we compare across the columns, the different behavior in the tail can also be captured by changing the uh, skewing function G. So for example, here I do the, the first column, the skewing function G to be the standard normal distribution function. But the second one, I do the Cauchy. And the third one, I do something more crazy, like the mixture of Cauchy and normal. So as long as they still symmetric around zero, the distribution function of a symmetric random variable around zero, they are, uh, I mean, they are able to form the proper density for the data that we assume. And so uh, by introducing that kind of parameters, the shape vector and the function, we can capture more shape of the data and make it more flexible. So that is the distribution that we will work with. And now back to the main topic, which is a graphical model. So now the problem is how can we estimate the graphical model for that kind of skew normal distribution? So the um, distribution for coming from the normal and introduce the skewing part. Okay, so First thing is about location and scale in that distribution. Okay, so here again is the density of the data we assume. So because in the multivariate Gaussian here, the C and the omega essentially is the mean and the standard error here, 
But when we already introduce the skewing function, they just become a location and a scale parameter. So they are no longer the mean and the standard error because the skewing function and the shape vector play into the computation of the moments. And so we just call that to be the location and the scale. And the nice thing about these parameters is they can be estimated separately. That means that if you got the data, you have p variables, you can kind of take a look at the marginal data. They will still in the class of the multivariate skew normal distribution. And we can estimate them separately without using the knowledge of alpha and the function g. And a variety of methods for estimating univariate location and scale parameter for the skill normal already developed in the literature. And so at least for this work, we just assume they are zero, the location to be zero, and the scale matrix to, to be the identity matrix. And so as a result, because uh, the sigma here will just become the correlation matrix. And um, we will just do that to simplify the process of estimating the graphical model. So now the first result here is if we have the random vector follow that kind of distribution when two components are conditionally independent. And the result here tells us that two components, yj and yk, are conditionally independent if and only if the corresponding element in the precision matrix equals zero. And the additional assumption is alpha j times alpha k equals zero. So at least one of the components in the shape vector should be zero. Okay, so the first condition is really similar to the case of multivariate Gaussian. So because in the multivariate Gaussian, we don't have the shape vector or all of them become zero. And so this is necessary sufficient condition for the multivariate normal. However, when we introduce some kind of shape or skewness, then the structure now change and it depends on the shape and to some extent it is reasonable because how the shape of data affects the conditional structure conditional dependent structure not just the second order sorry the second moment which is uh, um, precision matrix okay and now the main thing now is then how we estimate that because here the alpha the shape vector becomes the main issue and it is not easy to estimate the alpha directly the reason is if we don't assume the skewing function to be known and then so in the form of the density function here so even the omega and the c is known, then maybe some kind of like identifiability issue can be present because g is unknown and alpha is also unknown. And so why is it possible to do some kind of non-parametric maximum likelihood, but it's not straightforward and it's not really easy even the G also has kind of some kind of constraint on that as well. And one particular challenge is, unlike location scale parameter, the shape vector is not reserved marginally. So for the scale and location, if we take just the data from one component, then we can estimate the location and scale. But for the shape vector, the alpha j is not reserved marginally. So here I put so yj still belongs to the class of the distribution. 
But the corresponding element in the shape of the alpha j is not the shape vector of that marginal distribution. And even more interesting is alpha j equals to zero does not mean that the yj is marginally normal. So when you take the marginal distribution in that case, the overall shape of the joint distribution come into play and affects the shape of the marginal distribution, not just one uh, component alpha j. And so that's why even alpha j was zero. That does not mean the yj is marginally normal. So estimating alpha directly is challenging. And so what we take is we go around that and we consider maybe other necessary and sufficient conditions for conditional independent from the conditional expectation directly. So we want to see if we take the conditional mean, whether we can kind of have enough information to declare conditional dependence or independent. And fortunately, we can do that. And so the next result is, okay, let's take a look at the conditional distribution here. Okay, so I just said before, if alpha j equals to zero, then the marginal distribution of yj is not normal. However, the conditional distribution is still normal. So if we remember in the Gaussian case, it's very special when both the marginal and conditional are normal. But here, if we introduce the skewing part, the marginal is no longer normal, but the conditional distribution is still normal. And this conditional mean and variance of that conditional distribution is exactly the same as if the data follow the multivariate normal distribution. So that is uh, one kind of, I think, special property in that kind of distribution. Okay, so that is the first result. The second result on that, okay, let's take a look at the conditional mean or the conditional expectation. So if we do the conditional expectation of yj given on the others, so the form of the conditional expectation looks like that. So in the form here, we have a couple of components. The first component here is, I denote that like beta one. So the substitute J is just kind of uh, to indicate that we are taking the conditional expectation of YJ. So the first linear combination here, beta one, is exactly the same linear combination as if Y is Gaussian. So we know that when the data follow the multivariate normals then the conditional mean is exactly a linear function. And that linear function or that linear combination is exactly the same for the beta j1, the first linear combination here as well, beta1. Okay, then the next thing is this part. So it is a nonlinear part that is introduced by the skewing function. So first of all is the one inside the function is on, I call that beta two. So beta two here depends on what beta one and the shape vector alpha. And that is not surprising because it's where the shape vector and the skewing function plays into. And the G function here is a nonlinear function that depends on the G. So, which is the skewing function. Well, but the special properties of this one here is the last expression here. The, the linear and nonlinear part are orthogonal to each other. So, this part, the first part, is the part really comes from the normal. The nonlinear part really comes from the skewing. And if I type the expectation of the product, here, I get exactly zero. So that means that in that kind of distribution, linear and nonlinear part kind of orthogonal and they act differently, completely 
independently on the condition of being. And so um, by working around the conditional expectation here, now we can translate that into the condition for conditional independence. So, okay, so before doing that, a couple of notes here. So this kind of conditional expectation is called something like extended partially single index model. Uh, so this is a term proposed by one biomagical paper in 1999. But here, the special thing we have is the linear and nonlinear part being orthogonal to each other. And so now with that kind of conditional expectation, we can transform the condition for conditional independent into a form that we can work with from the data. So the result here is that, okay, now let's take a look at the first condition. So we need for the conditional independent, we need to have uh, the corresponding element in the precision matrix is equal to zero. And so if we translate that into the conditional mean, that means that the first element, the first linear combination beta one. So let's say I take the conditional distribution of yj given all the others. So if yj and yk are conditionally independent, that means the corresponding element for yk equal to zero. So that is something also similar to the case of the Gaussian distribution. And similar thing is um, uh, because omega is a symmetric matrix, and so we also have the other way around. So the corresponding element for yj in the conditional expectation of yk also should be equal to zero the first part because it really mimics what we have for the conditional uh, distribution in the Gaussian case. The second part is, okay, because alpha j, at least one of the alpha j and alpha k should be equal to zero. And we know that when alpha j equal to zero, that means the conditional distribution become exactly normal. And so that means at least one of the nonlinear function in the conditional expectation should be uh, a zero function. Uh, so I think I have a typo here. It should be a zero function. So the con two condition is one is on the first part of the conditional mean, and the other is on the nonlinear function. At least one of them has to be a zero function. And with that kind of result, we can propose a method to estimate the graphical model from the data. So, um, so assume now we have the data and uh, have an N observation, and each of them has P variables. And I assume again, the location and scale to be known to be zero and the scale to be the identity matrix. And we want to estimate undirected graphical structure from the data and more specifically the S set. And it is the same as determine which of the pair are conditionally dependent and which are conditionally independent. So now the method and what we do from the theoretical result on the population is, okay, so the conditional expectation had like that, the linear part and nonlinear part are orthogonal. And so we can estimate them in a two step. The first step is we fit the linear model and we can obtain the uh, estimate here as a beta half one. So for the conditional mean of yj, and we obtain the residual from that model. And here, so uh, assume we have a n greater than p, the number of observations greater than the number of variables, then we can use the least square to estimate the first component. And here I just um, put the formula for that. 
So that is the first step. And the second step is, so after we get the residual from the first step, the linear model, then, okay, so essentially now, if you know the beta J one here, you can take that out by getting the residual from the linear model, and then you fit the residual against the non-linear part here. And uh, the projection pursuit regression is perfectly set up for that kind of task. And so here is a form for the projection pursuit regression. And essentially, the constraint is just to make sure that everything in here are identifiable. And so essentially, the G nonlinear function is estimated by the whole sum here, by the first two terms. So the mu j zero essentially will be estimated by the mean. And the second term, essentially, we put some condition like here, the it is scaled to one. And so the tau j essentially tells us about the kind of the scale of the nonlinear function. And since we are mostly interested in whether the function, the nonlinear function is zero or not, we only want to see whether the estimate for the scale here is equal to zero or not. And uh, essentially, uh, we prove that when we do the projection pursuit regression, that kind of the tau j here corres uh, converge to the standard deviation of the function g. And so from that, we can kind of um, see if the tau is small, then we can have evidence that the, the nonlinear function is truly a, a zero function. And this kind of model fit is implemented by the PPR function. So it's in the base R. So no additional package is needed for that. And so we repeat the whole thing for all the nodes or all the components, and we estimate uh, with, uh, the first linear combination and then the scale tau hat here. And then after that, what we only need to do is we combine them together. So we form the two matrices. So one is B1, the other B2. So the components of that, so for the first one, it is essentially because the two quantity, the beta for beta JK and beta KJ for the first linear combination should be equal to zero. So I just take the maximum of that. And so when yj and yk are conditionally independent, this one should be small. And similar thing, because we need alpha j and alpha k equal to zero, or at least one of the, one of the nonlinear function to be a zero function, then we can form the product tau j tau k. And so that means that when this is small or when this is very close to zero, we can have uh, evidence that maybe one of the two non-linear functions is a zero function. And because for the sufficient necessary and sufficiency condition, we need two conditions. One is on the first uh, linear combination, the other is on the function. Now I can combine them, compound so component like in a component wise, and then I form some kind of norm here, and then just kind of declare yj and yk to be conditionally independent if the term here is small, or we do kind of press holding, which is a press hold. So that is um, the methods that we um, propose. So next thing is I just want to show a quick simulation study to demonstrate how our new method works. So, okay, so the setup for the simulation
Essentially, we generate the data from the skew now distribution, location zero, identity skew matrix, and uh, here I just show one case when we, I chose the skew function G to be standard normal CDF. So in the paper, we did more situations like G to be the Cauchy CDF as well. Here is uh, one particular structure for the omega. So it is uh, generated following some something on a scale free structure. So it is a particular structure usually used in the literature of the graphical model. Then the P here, the city, so city variables. And okay, so with city variables, then we have uh, like, yeah, 1770 pairs to estimate. So we have to determine whether uh, on the pairs are conditionally dependent or independent. And so the sample size here is, we chose 250 and 1000. And so the number of pairs we have to estimate is still much bigger than the observation that we had in the simulation. Okay, the next thing in the simulation setup is about the shape vector. So what we did is we tried to deviate from the normal. So uh, remember that the number of non-zero components in the shape vector indicate how far we are from the multivariate normal. And so uh, I vary the S2, the number of non-zero components in three cases. One is 10%, 30%, and 50%. So in 10%, that means the data not really far from multivariate Gaussian. 30%, yeah, it's kind of medium away. But 50% of them are non-zero. That means it's really far from the Gaussian. And the non-zero components here are just generated from a particular uniform distribution with a random sign. So with that kind of structure, so the number of conditionally dependent pairs is 4%, 12%, 27% of the total number of pairs. So with uh, S2 is only 10% of P, then only 4% um, uh, of the pairs are conditionally dependent. When we increase the S2, then the number of conditionally dependent pairs is increasing. And here I generated 500 data set for each setting. So the structure, the graph is not so sparse. So 4% is quite sparse, but um, uh, so 4% usually is the range where the graph is sparse, but 27% usually is not too sparse, but it's not too dense because here at least I only like, like only one. Um, a quarter of the possible in the possible pairs are still conditionally dependent. So why the graph is not too sparse or it's not too dense either. And so in the simulation, we compare the new method with two kind of methods. One is the methods for Gaussian graphical model. So what happened if we just assume the data follow the Gaussian and apply the method there? And the other method is, this one is kind of like two non-Gaussian graphical models that are already developed in the literature. So we just try to compare with both the Gaussian graphical model methods and the method non-Gaussian that already there. And we use, because now I don't, I didn't talk to the problem of how to choose the threshold and so, what I will do is to use the ROC curve, the receiver receiving operating characteristic to compare the different methods. And so here is the first case when n equal to 250. So essentially, each of the plot here corresponds to one situation of the non zero components of the shape vector. The first one is when it is only 10%, the middle one 30%, and the drawing on here is 50%. And so, okay, 
when the data is not really too far from the normal and n is only 250, then here the new method represented by the purple line here. So the ROC curve is not as good as the other methods. And the main reason for that is because the second step in the method we propose, we do some kind of non parametric regression. And so when the sample size is relatively small, so the quality of the estimated tau is not, may not be that good. And so that's why we see in that case here, the matter is not as good as the other matters. However, when the data becomes far more away from the Gaussian, then our ROC curve is much better than the other matter, especially in the case here. Like if you take, I don't include the uh, area under the curve statistic here, but even in that case, most of the methods we compare with the are the area under the curve is only about like 50 or 60 percent so that it can be really evidence by looking at the curve here but our method it has i mean much better performance even with the n equal to 250. now the next thing is i increase the sample size 1000. now the case when we don't do well in the case of n equal to 250 but now it becomes much better. And essentially, when the data is not too far away from the Gaussian, all the methods are relatively doing the same. So the ROC curve essentially really not really distinguishable from the others. However, the same thing happened when the data deviate away from the Gaussian, then our method, the ROC curve is much better than the other methods that we compare against. And so that kind of to demonstrate that when the data kind of exhibit some kind of skill or uh, really uh, away from the Gaussian, you really need to take that into account if we want to estimate the graphical model. So now I just briefly mentioned the problem of selecting the threshold for our methods so essentially, uh, I don't go into the details here, but we use a similar procedure developed by a recent paper. So we select the threshold that minimize some kind of magic based on complexity and connectivity of the estimate of graph. So uh, that kind of procedure developed for the Gaussian graphical model case. So we did some simulation on that and they show that they tend to overfit when the sample size is small, but it can recover the true graph when the sample size is large. So it has a really low false positive and also very low false negative. And we put more details on that in the paper. So last thing is about a data example that we want to see how the method um, perform. So back to the um, Y data. So we have uh, 11 properties and sample size is equal 1600. And we want to est uh, establish the conditional dependent structure. And here, first of the thing is, I want to check whether the data really deviate from the Gaussian. And so uh, I use some kind of hypothesis testing for multivariate Gaussian distribution. And the p value is really small. That means that we kind of reject the multivariate Gaussian. Then, okay, we assume the general line multivariate skew normal. And here uh, we just add some notation on that. And so the first of all is we use a method to estimate the location and scale parameters. So we use one developed by this paper. And so we transform the data into kind of standardization. So the location for the Z here becomes zero and the scale to be on one. And now we apply the method 
um, that we developed to estimate the graphical model on that. And here are the results. So essentially, I pick one method from the Russian graphical model and compare that with the new method that we propose. And so here, the red line you can see here essentially is the kind of connection that found in both the graph. Uh, the black line is the one that only found in the Gaussian graphical model. And the blue line is the one that only found in from the new method that we proposed. And if we take a look at that plot, it the result makes sense because if we cheat the data to be Gaussian, then we may miss our lot of conditional dependence due to the shape. Because essentially, when we cheat the data to be the Gaussian, we ignore only the skewness or kurtosis or tail, the something related to the shape. And so if we apply our method here, we take the shape vector into account, then we found more kind of relationship. And so if we, uh, I mean, uh, analyze the estimated graph here, so these properties here, like this variable here, they form kind of like a subgroup in the graph. And a lot of the Gaussian graphical case here, like the two properties here, are quite kind of independent, though, really separate from the other. But in this graph here, like the blue line, you can see how the things are connected more than in the Russian graphical case. So that is um, kind of um, uh, the thing. And so here's a quick summary of the talk. So we proposed a new method to estimate the underrated graphical model from a flexible plus distribution and the method consists of the two steps. So first the linear model, and then we do the projection pursuit. And after that, we can do some kind of test holding to estimate the graph. And I don't show the theoretical result that we were able to achieve, but uh, the numerical result is really favoring us compared to other methods for estimating the Gaussian and non-Gaussian graphical model and uh, thing last one minute maybe there's some discussion here so we um, we we're thinking about how to improve the two two step method and for example because now we still assume n is uh greater than p so we can use ordinary least square but when n is smaller than p so we may need to do some penalized regression and then a lot of Questions can arise like how to choose the tuning parameter in that case, because now the conditional mean is not a linear model anymore, but we also have the non-linear term. And so that may affect how we should choose the tuning parameter. And the last question is, can we extend it to even more flexible class of multivariate skills in magic distribution? So the general form of that is this one. So essentially, uh, the G naught here, the PDF for the multivariate symmetric, and the pi is more general skewing function. Well, it's very tempting to do in the more general form, but the caveat of that is the conditional independent may not occur for every choice of G naught and pi. And one example of that is if we restrict the G naught to be in the multivariate elliptical distribution, then the conditional independent does not occur outside of the multivariate version. So that is a result in a 2004 paper. So essentially, it says that in the elliptical distribution, conditional independent is really a distinct property for the multivariate version. And so if we want to kind of extend like to a more flexible class of not very skills logic distribution, we will need to be kind of careful 
on the class on uh, on the distribution where the conditional dependent can still be possible. So here are some of those references and uh, thank you for the uh, for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Lee. That was great. Uh, great presentation and an awesome project. Um, are there any questions for me? So if you have a question, you can unmute yourself. Or, yeah, Michael raised his hand. Michael, go for it. Oh, thanks. That was very interesting, Lynn. Thanks very much. Um, it's really an interesting idea, This um, how the, your, your shape parameters are zero is a, is a necessary condition for ind conditional independence. Yep. Um, so what this sort of means is that the more conditional independence there is in the distribution, the closer it is to multivariate normal, right? Yes. Yeah. But yes. at the same time, you're trying to get away from multivariate normal, and within multivariate normal, you can have any dependent structure you like. So it's sort of really strange, the the whole sort of range of possibilities. But um, uh, can you comment on that? Uh, yeah. So my idea on that is um, like. Yeah, so essentially the shape vector is a thing that control things here. So why we cannot go too far away from the normal, we still need to take the extra thing into account. So yeah, and yes, and uh, that's my take on that. And so it is like how you really can can and take like the shape here when the data maybe is not really too far away from the normal but still like conditional independence still exists yeah mm. i mean you touched on it at the end there in that um in fact conditional independence and so on is actually quite a special property of the normal distribution really um and so perhaps yeah. if we're going to go away from normal distributions generally in, in an analysis of these models Maybe we have to look at, at, at more general properties, like conditionally uncorrelated or something like that. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. but it really depends on what kind of direction you want to generalize the normal. Hmm. Because sure. like here, the way I generalize that is I introduce the skewing function. But if you generalize in the sense like, for example, like elliptical, then it is it is not possible for conditional independent anymore. But right. I do agree with you that I mean maybe some kind of like weaker condition like uncorrelatedness may be possible in a wider class of distribution. Mm. Okay, thanks Lynn. Thank you, Michael. No worries. In fact, can I ask one more thing? Oh yes. Um I, 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 I didn't follow all the detail completely correctly, but my impression is that because you were only looking at this conditional dependence structure, did you actually, you'd never really have to estimate capital G properly, is that right? Or not? Yes. So I don't have to estimate the capital G. Okay. But those little gj's, those nonlinear parts, you don't have to explicitly estimate any part of them either, you're just looking at whether something is zero or not, is that right? Yes. Okay. Be because uh, one thing here is um, uh, in the projection pursuit regression. So, if so, essentially in in the regression setting, you need to put some condition on the G to estimate like the linear part inside that. Uh -huh. But here, if the function is really like the G, the nonlinear function is a zero function then essentially you are not really able to get anything inside because this is a problem of uh, identifiability mm -hmm. and that's why we only choose to i mean check whether the nonlinear function is a zero function or not okay all right well thanks very much lynn that was a great talk thank you Any other, are there any other comments for Lynn?
And then I, I actually have maybe uh, two very brief questions. Uh, the first one is, why would you want something a little bit more general than this Q normal, for example? Isn't it is not flexible enough? Uh, yeah, there is some kind of um, risk, I mean, constraint on the like like the skill number in the sense that i think like if you do like g not here to be like the multivariate t distribution i think that is a distribution skill t right and so i think they still kind of capture i think more shape of the data than if you kind of only kind of uh, introduce the skewing function from the multivariate skew normal. That is um, my my thought on that. Yeah, but but then uh, you were saying that if you look at the Baba paper, then basically you can't you won't have the same property of conditional independence if you're picking the skew t. Yeah, that is some. I mean, the first time I look at that, I think it's kind of interesting and disappointing at the same time in the sense that uh, it's really easy to lose conditional independence. And so, uh, but maybe that is not a kind of a good direction to generalize things because you can choose, maybe, because I do see people do something like choose a G not here to be like uniform the multivariate uniform distribution on some bounded interval in each component. And then they model the skewing part to be, I mean, to like kind of non-parametrically as well. And so maybe in that case, conditional independence still possible. That is what I hope and I mean, come from the top of my head at this moment. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I follow what you're suggesting. Uh, there is also a, a question from uh, Robert Kunz. Uh, Robert, if you want to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, yeah, ahead. yeah. On the real data, you looked at normal versus skew normal, but why in real data would you ever imagine that uh, a skew normal would be the good fit? Uh, yeah, so that, that's a good question because I, well, yeah, so I do not really kind of, yeah, some kind of do um, goodness of fit for the, uh, for the skill normal, uh, well, essentially because we don't really kind of have the measure for estimating the G and alpha directly. And so even with that, the uh, goodness of fit is still kind of challenging. And so that's why here I just do like, okay, so we reject the normal and we believe that our cluster distribution is flexible enough to capture the shape of the data and but, apply but you know but you know it's not skew normal is not but let me ask uh, let me ask um another question why do you care about there's another way to look at this and that's to get parsimony in the inverse of the covariance matrix yeah. Or in the inverse of, of a matrix or the matrix itself. What mm -hmm. is it that's important about conditional independence when it comes to skew normal distributions that's so attractive? Do you ever use it or do you just use parsimony? Uh, so, I mean, first of all, is about the meaning of the conditional independence itself. Because, I mean, in the Gaussian case, because the passing, on, passing money in the precision matrix is essentially the same as the conditional independence. So that's why we kind of, kind of I don't know, like exchange or use that interchangeably. 
But and when it comes to data that is not normal anymore, so the really thing that matter is the conditional independence in the sense that like how one of the variables are connected to with each other in the graph. And so, for example, like if you, that's what I, uh, um, so for example, if you want to compare like two systems, and then for example, like I see some kind of like a gene data. So essentially, you want to see how the gene are connected in two groups and see how they are different. And so the matter is how the conditional independent, not just the kind of whether the zero pattern in the precision matrix. That's my belief in that. Yeah, because you'd be, uh, it's a lot easier asking questions about parsimony than it is formulating yeah. models like, uh, the skew normal is a very limited model actually. Um, it's a lot easier asking parsimony. My third little question is, when you look at Gaussian graphical models, you can look at chordal models, you can uh, find the structure of the chordal, you can find mm. the structure of the models, even if they're not decomposable, and uh, you can, in the Bayesian analysis, you can integrate out parameters and that. Mm. Can you do yeah. the same thing for the skew normal th stuff? Uh, I think that's, um, yeah, we haven't looked at that, but I think it will be an interesting idea, like when you try to kind of um, put some more uh, structure, like for example, decomposability. So I think in the literature, when one, I think one paper study the um, Russian, the skill novel, so they have to put in some condition for decomposability so that the precision matrix itself, like the parsimony of that, also reflect the conditional dependent or conditional independent. But to me, I mean, decomposability is still, is, well, I, I don't want to say it's very limited, but it's still restricted in some sense that you need to have some kind of like prior information on the graph. And that's, um, we, we don't want to impose that kind of condition. You don't need that. You can actually do inference that finds the structure. Yeah, for the, if the Bayesian analysis, I think, yeah, in the Russian case, what I'm aware of is that like you put some kind of prior probability on whether a component is zero or not. And so you can do inference on like at the end, like what is the posterior probability for the um, for an, uh, yeah for conditional independent and yeah and so I think that may be possible to do that in the skill normal or here I try to generalize it more by not uh, fixing the skewing function to be the standard normal CDF and so um, that is yeah I think one. I think good maybe idea that we can we can try. Yep. Yeah, thanks Lin, for for these um, um, explanations and uh, opinions. Uh, are there any just a uh, final quick uh, comments for Lin? If not, let's uh, thank Lynn again for a, for a great talk and a great uh, project. Uh, and see you next time. Thanks, yeah. Lynn. Thank you. Yeah.